Good day, everyone. Uh, this lecture slides uh, follows from the discussion from weeks one and two, Tripoli uh, 113 on power systems. Uh, if you have questions on this slide, feel free to contact me by email as shown here or post via our Piazza forum. So the topic of week three is on electric power transmission and distribution. In the first two weeks of this course, we were introduced to various generation technologies and types of utilization of electrical energy. We also realized that as generation match the demand, generation resources and loads are not necessarily co-located. In many cases, Load centers are located far from the generation resources. So we need the infrastructure to deliver power from generation to loads. Hence, we need the transmission and distribution facilities. And that's what we'll cover in week three. We generally refer to this as the P and B of electric power systems. As a visual representation, perhaps, this looks familiar. You must have seen towers like this along the highways, or this, poles with transformers mounted on it, or this. Uh, we'll cover this later, so we'll skip that for now. The main reference here for this chapter is for this week is still from this book, Electric Power Systems, and the a conceptual introduction by Sasha von Meyer, uh, mostly on chapters three, six, and nine. For this deck of slides, we focus on chapter six, parts of chapter six, and section 9.1 from chapter nine. That's me on the right there. On the middle is Sir Dr. Mike Pedraza, our director. And on the left here is Sasha von Meyer whom we have worked with in some research project. Copies of these chapters are available from the engineering library, uh, electronic collections, and also posted in our UBLE course page. As an introductory material, we can cover this week the following learning outcomes. Our Tripoli students in week three shall be able to describe why we have an expanded and interconnected electric power network. To deliver power, we have two important sectors, the transmission sector and the distribution se sector with their corresponding networks. We should be able to compare and contrast these two networks and to conduct basic evaluations for the TND networks. We also recognize that the TND network operate with AC voltages and currents. So we also have to expand our weeks one and two DC calculations to AC calculations. And that is covered in a separate lecture slide. Before we proceed, we recall the following characteristics of generation systems. The first one is important. Resources that are used to produce electric energy are location specific. For example, if we need a hydroelectric power plant, the generators will be by large river or large falls. If we need wind power, we need some place where there is consistent wind speed. For solar PV, we need some place with large area. Even power plants such as coal or natural gas, we will need some place where we can transport such fuel. For example, for a coal power plant, we need a port for coal delivery, such as for bumper ships. Our natural gas supply in the West Philippine Sea is needed to transport power to power plants located in Batangas province. So we have gas pipes between west of Palawan to Batangas. We are aware that most power plants are located by the shore. That's because we need large amount of water as a cooling medium, among other reasons. 
However, load centers are not there. Study the system diagram here, where multiple generators are interconnected to loads via transmission and distribution networks. The first important component are the large generators, which you learned in week one. Shown here are example large generators in the Philippines. On the left side is a thermal station, which is similar to what we have in Suwal Pangasinan, a coal power plant. In the middle here is a geothermal power plant, which is similar to what we have here, the geothermal power plants in Leyte and in Laguna and Batangas. We also have hydroelectric power plants in the Philippines. And shown here is Magat Dam, which is located in Cagayan in northern Luzon. We can also have smaller power plants that are closer to the load centers, such as what we have here as windmills in Pilila Rizal, or diesel plant by the Laguna Lake, which are actually close to Metro Manila, to Rizal and Laguna, which are load centers. Those generators are connected to transmission lines. The bigger generators are connected to tall transmission lines and transmission towers that you can see along the highways for crossing mountains and fields. While the smaller generators that we saw earlier can be connected to not so tall towers or distribution poles. Shown here are two lines for larger capacity. If you see the actual towers, each line in the diagram corresponds to a set of three wires. For example, here you see six wires, three here and three there. So these towers have six prominent wires corresponding to two wires, two lines here. Later, we will talk about three phase systems to explain why a set of three wires for each line. Additional lines may be seen as well, but these are for protecting the wires and for communication wires. Those lines terminate in substations shown here, which look like this. The main component of the substation is the power trans transformer, whose main function is to transform the voltage from a higher voltage here to lower voltage here. For example, from the power plant, there are transformers somewhere here. From lower voltage to higher voltage for the transmission. For the transmission lines going to customers here, we have higher voltage to lower voltage. Now we're getting closer to customers. From the transmission lines and substation, power will now flow to be delivered to towns and cities here. For a mega city such as Metro Manila, we have a network of lines from many sources to many groups of customers. For smaller towns, we have a distribution system from one main source to many or practically all customers. Also shown here on the left are electric poles, which is much shorter than transmission towers, and distribution transformers mounted on the poles. More details of the distribution system are shown here. Power flows from the transmission lines to, or subtransmission lines, then through substation here where voltage will be transformed from higher voltage, a few hundred kilovolts, to a lower voltage, somewhere less than 40 kilovolts. Then from the substation to many feeders, that's one feeder there, another feeder here. In UP campus, there are many primary distribution lines from a substation along Commonwealth Avenue. Primary distribution lines terminate in a distribution transformer, such as this one, which are usually mounted on posts that you can see along the street. From there, we have secondary distribution lines that terminate on customer premises and power gets to our homes. That's a rather lengthy introduction on the components of the power system and how power from generators 
gets to customers. We need transmission and distribution facilities to deliver power from generation to load. But why do we bother with large complex systems like this? It could have been much easier if every customer gets its own small generator, even a rooftop solar PV to supply its own needs. It is much simpler, but not necessarily better. Large and expanding interconnections are necessary in the Philippines. We have large interconnected network. We have one large network in Luzon. We call it the Luzon grid. We also have a Visayas grid over here, and we have a Mindanao grid here. Luzon grid is even connected to the Visayas grid via link from Naga to Leyte. Here. This was originally designed to allow power from latest geothermal power plants to supply large demand in Luzon. Eventually, when more natural gas from West Palawan was used to deliver uh, to produce power in Luzon, power was now transmitted from Luzon to Visayas, especially with increasing demand in Cebu. There is another HBDC link that is being built right now to interconnect Visayas to Mindanao. That is from Cebu, from the southern tip here to the northern tip here of Mindanao in Zamboanga del Norte. We are hoping that these interconnections within and across islands allow us to build large power plants, supply large demands, and can facilitate various flow of power depending on the situation. It's generally cheaper to build large power plants than small ones. Generation reserves are power plants that are available as backup in case any of the scheduled power plant has trouble. Such reserves make the entire system more reliable. If we have an interconnected system, we can have a variety of backup generators. Later, we will talk about the grid connection, which is a characteristic of the transmission network. Such connection enhances the reliability of the system as well. The third reason is related to load factor. And let us look what load factor is all about. Shown here is a load curve, which plots the power consumed every hour by the hour for a 24-hour period. The horizontal axis shows the hours of the day, while the vertical axis shows the amount of power consumed. The unit is in megawatts. So this represents a large group of residential customers. But let us imagine our own households. In the wee hours of the day, everyone in the household is asleep and we use very little electricity. Even if the aircon is on, we usually set the thermostat lower very early in the morning as it may get really cold. At around 6 a.m., you may wake up and turn on the lights, cook breakfast, use hot water for shower. So electricity, has just increased. Electricity use increases further the rest of the day. If you're studying at home and your parents are working at home, electricity is used throughout the day. Many even reach a peak before lunchtime. As family cooks meal. At noon time, we turn off some devices and the power consumption reduces a little bit. After lunch, work continues, and at around 6 p.m., family turns lights on. Daily peak usually happens at around 7 a.m., 7 p.m., when meal is again cooked while some are still working, while some could still be watching TV. Some will continue working until late in the evening. But activities generally wind down until everyone is asleep 
before midnight. What we have learned here is that the load pattern as shown here, which shows how much power is being consumed every hour by the hour, is based largely on human activities and machineries that are working. For this particular curve, we compute the load factor, which is the ratio between the average load and the peak load. In this case, the average load is around 12 megawatts and the peak load is at 18 megawatts. So load, the factor there is 12 over 18, around two thirds. But what's the trouble here? We have electrical equipment that are rated 18 megawatts, able to operate at and meet the peak demand. However, throughout the day, electricity is much less than that. So equipment are generally underutilized. What is the ideal case there to remain this fully utilized? To make this curve flat, to make the peak load very close to the average load. So basically the average load is very close to the peak load. The load factor in the ideal case is one. And we can only achieve that if we have a large community with varying connect connectivities and varying behaviors. So if you have a large network that is interconnected, we can somehow flatten this load curve. We will pause here as the end of part one and we'll have another deck of slides for part two. Thank you for listening.